You ever uh, wake up from a dream and you're all panicky and out of sorts because of the content of the dream? You know, I'm not talking about a fictional dream, like you're being eaten by a T-Rex or something like that, uh, or, or you're falling out of an airplane and, you know, as soon as you wake up, you're grabbing onto your pillow for dear life, and, and uh, I'm not talking about that kind of dream, because when you wake up from that kind of dream, you immediately realize it was, you know, just a dream. Um, but I'm talking about the kind of dream where you wake up and you're all panicky because you're still confused as to, did that really happen? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Um, where it seems to be very real. And I don't know about you, but for me, some of the most real bad dreams are those where I've, I'm forgetting something. I had a dream uh, not too long ago, just a few months ago, where I forgot to turn in a very important assignment to my professor. And um, now, I need you to know, I, I finished my schooling 17 years ago. And so I don't know what kind of psychological damage seminary did to me, but it's pretty severe. And, um, you know, my feeble mind, I don't know if I can take it. Uh, or, or have you ever had this dream where you're out in public and, and uh, you forgot to put on your clothes? <laughs> Few of, not me, I'm asking for a friend. But, um, <laughs> you know, and, and so uh, fortunately for all of us, there's, there's uh, this little thing out there called the Internet. You can get on the internet and uh, find these self-appointed experts who can interpret your dreams. And, uh, you, know, you know, if it's on the internet, of course, it has to be true. And uh, I came across one dream interpreter who said this, forgetting something could be your subconscious telling you to leave something behind. You've forgotten it for a good reason, because you don't need it in your life anymore. Well, thank goodness. Honey! Internet told me I don't need my clothes anymore. <laughs> yeah. My friend will be so relieved. But, you know, forgetting stuff is a very human thing to do. Because uh, we're not perfect, right? And, you know, when we get older and uh, the synapses aren't firing quite as much or as well, the forgetting becomes a little more, uh, what's the word? Frequent. And so we forget things. We forget where we put our glasses. You know, we forget where we put our keys. Or if it's really bad, we forget where we put our clothes. You know, might need some help on that one. But I'm glad for one thing today. I'm glad that God does not forget things like you and me. Aren't you? I mean, I want you to think about it. There's not many things that God forgets. In fact, let's make a list. Let's make a list of things that God forgets. We're going to make a list of all of them, okay? So let's see, what could go on this list? Maybe maybe God forgets that He's God. You think that's a possibility? No. I don't think God has any problems with self-awareness. I think God knows at all times who He is. I don't think He ever forgets that He is God. Or maybe, maybe God forgets his promises. No, I don't think that's true either. Uh, God has never forgotten a promise that he's made, and, and I don't think he ever will. So that can't go on the list. I know. Maybe God has forgotten you. You think that's on the list? Now, To be sure, a lot of us from time to time think that, but God's forgotten us. But I want you to know, God has not forgotten you. He's never forgotten you. Even if you've drifted away from him for a while, God hasn't forgotten you. I mean, think about it. How could he forget you? You're what we might say unique, right? And God is the one that made you that way. Unique is a nicer way of saying than weird, okay? But you are very unique, aren't you? Every one of us are. And God made us just the way we are. And so there's no way that God could forget someone like you. 
And so God hasn't forgotten that he's God. He hasn't forgotten his promises. And he hasn't forgotten you. But I can think of one thing that God forgets. Your sin. God forgets your sins. Now, when we talk about God forgetting your sins, it's not an issue of Him having a faulty memory. You and I have imperfect memories. God is not like us. God's memory is impeccable. It is perfect. And so when we talk about God forgetting our sins, we need to understand it this way. He chooses not to bring them up anymore. To Him... They're gone. Your sins are as good as forgotten as far as God is concerned. God says it this way, For I will forgive their wrongdoing, and I will never again remember their sins. I like the way King James puts it, I will remember their sins No more. No more. Gone and forgotten. You see, the problem that we have with God is not that God has forgotten something that he should have remembered. Sometimes we might even think, well, God has forgotten that he's God. Because look at this world and all the turmoil in it. Where's God in it? Maybe God forgot he's God. Or we think, well, God has forgotten his promises because I'm going through a bad time. Or we think, poor little old me, God must have forgotten me. He remembers everything else, but he forgot little old me because my life is such a mess. But the reality is God hasn't forgotten any of those things The problem that we have in our relationship with God is not that God has forgotten something that he should have remembered. It's that we have. We have forgotten something that we should have remembered. And today, I want to talk to you about remembering the commitment that you made to Jesus perhaps a long time ago. And I hope that you'll understand that we should not live like we've forgotten him. And to help us, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. And I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me, please, to the book of Colossians. It's in the New Testament, near the back. In Colossians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It's right after Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians, and you'll find Colossians. Chapter 2 verses 1 through 7, and when you found that, or you could read the scriptures on the screen behind me as we read this uh, out loud, I'll read out loud, in fact, and you'll read silently, I, ask, I would ask you to stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to read this brief passage, and then we'll go back and study a few things a little closer. For I want you to know how greatly I'm struggling for you, for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love, so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In Him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well-ordered you are in the strength of your faith in Christ. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in Him, being rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Father in heaven, I pray that you would allow your word to speak and penetrate our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the guy that wrote this little passage of Scripture that we read is a guy by the name of Paul. And Paul had, in fact, never met the people that uh, he was writing to, at least not most of them. And uh, he, he was still concerned about them because you don't have to meet someone to be concerned about them, right? 
I mean, I, I don't know of very many people from Ukraine that I've met, but I'm pretty concerned about the people in that nation, right? And so it was this way with Paul for different reasons. But Paul was concerned about these people that he largely had never met. And so he writes in verse 1, For I want you to know how greatly I'm struggling for you, for those in Laodicea, another place that Paul had not been, and for all who have not seen me in person. And there's a reason Paul was worried about them, and the reason Paul was worried about them was this, because he had never met them. Now, why would that make Paul worry? Because it's this way. If Paul had met them, Paul would have encouraged them to remain faithful to Christ. But these were Christians that Paul had never met before. And so how in the world is Paul going to encourage these people that he's never met to be faithful in Christ? In fact, Paul really had a problem because Paul was in prison hundreds of miles away in another city called Rome. And so how is Paul going to encourage them to remain faithful in Christ? Well, that's why he wrote the letter. That's why he wrote this passage. And Paul says, here's what Paul wants out of this whole thing. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, he says, I want their hearts to be encouraged. Well, that's nice. He says, I want them to be joined together in love. Well, that's good. Christians ought to be joined together in love. Okay, that's cool. That's good. So that they may have all the riches. Oh, I like this passage of Scripture. The riches. Okay, what kind of riches are we talking about? We're talking about gold, silver, crypto. Come on, what kind of riches are we talking about? No, it's not of those kinds of riches because those kinds of riches are temporary, especially crypto. Those kinds of riches are very, very temporary. The riches he's talking about are eternal, much more valuable. He wants us, he wants them to have all the riches of complete understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. He wants us to understand and know that God has a mystery. And it is, in a word, Christ. Now what's this mystery all about? Well, here's the deal about the mystery. Before God had created anything, before the foundation of the world, that's the way the Bible likes to call it, God had a plan. God's plan was to create a family. This family would include humans of all kinds, even humans in West Texas. Isn't that nice? God wants to include us in his family. But God kept his plan a secret for a very long time. You go back thousands of years in the writing of the Old Testament, what, we, what the uh, Jews call the Hebrew Bible, and God kept his, his plan a secret, a mystery, hidden from even the people that wrote the Old Testament. Now, there were fragments of God's plan here and there, but nobody could put it all together. It was like a a terrible jigsaw puzzle that no one could put together. And so God kept his plan a secret. And then Jesus came along, and his contemporaries, even his own disciples, they didn't understand the plan either. They could read all of the scriptures that we can in the Old Testament, but they couldn't put together all the pieces. God kept his plan a secret. Not only from humans, but God kept his plan a secret from the other spiritual beings that God had created. The spiritual beings that exist even to this day in this world, but you and I don't see them with our eyes. They're nevertheless there. God had created a lot of different other spiritual beings, and God kept his plan a secret from them as well. This was a mystery, hidden for ages. But at the appropriate time, God sent his son, Jesus, into our world. And what Jesus did was Jesus died on a cross. And what that accomplished was this. It paid for the penalty of your sins and mine. Every last one of them. Jesus paid the penalty. What's the penalty for sin? It's death. Jesus is the one who died on the cross. And he did it as our substitute to pay our penalty. But death could not hold 
Jesus. Jesus rose from the grave. Now, what that accomplished for you and me is this, that if you and I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who has risen from the grave, we will not only have our sins forgiven, but we will gain eternal life. Life forever with God. That's a pretty good deal. We trade in our sins and we get eternal life. I like that deal. If you've never signed up for that deal, today's a good day to sign up. That is the best deal you'll ever, ever get. But what it means is that you, from this point forward, acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and you strive to do His will. That's a part of believing faith. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Now, God's plan has been revealed. There's no more reason to keep it a secret. No force on heaven or earth can ever hinder God's plan because Jesus has already died on the cross. Jesus has already risen from the grave. And so now it's just up to you and me whether we want to be a part of God's family. And so Paul, who's writing this, he wants these believers that have never met him, sort of like you and me, he wants us to know this. It's that last phrase on the screen. That in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you're looking for purpose in life, you'll find it in Christ and nowhere else. If you're looking for meaning, if you're looking for understanding, you'll find it in Christ. And if today, You say that you are a Christian. Why in the world would you ever abandon the one in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found? But that's exactly what a lot of people have done. A lot of people have received Jesus into their life, or so they think. But now, As a matter of their daily lives, they look for real meaning elsewhere. And so people turn away from Jesus, and they try to fill up their lives with things that leave them empty. It's like trying to to pump a dry well in order to draw spiritual water for your part soul. You'll never get it. And that's why no matter what you try to put into your life, your life still feels empty. Nothing ever satisfies. No amount of money is ever enough. No drug lasts long enough. No relationship is meaningful enough. You're never, ever satisfied. And it's because you're looking for meaning in life at a well that gives you no spiritual water. God wants better for you than this. We read in the next few verses. Paul says, I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in body, but I am with you in spirit rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. Listen to me. If you have kept Jesus Christ out of your life for a while, there is a real danger that you could be deceived with arguments that sound reasonable. There is a deceiver, and the deceiver wants you to abandon your commitment to Christ altogether, but God has a different goal. We read in the previous chapter of Colossians, These words in verses 22 and 23. But now Christ has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you, this means to God, to present you to the Father, holy, faultless, blameless before him, if indeed you remain grounded 
and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. There's a real danger that once you stop listening to Christ and you start listening to the world, that you might be shifted away from your foundation. Do you know what I believe one of the most dangerous statements that we can make is? This one statement, I'm afraid, might be more misunderstood by people than any other. And if we misunderstand the intent of this statement that I'm about to make, we place ourselves in grave spiritual danger. And the statement that is a favorite among Baptists, is this. Once saved, always saved. Now I want you to listen to me carefully. I believe in the perseverance of the saints. I believe that God will complete what He has started. I believe that a true believer in Christ is eternally secure and no one will take that person out of the hands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or for that matter, as Jesus said in John chapter 10, out of the Father's hands. But in recent history, in order to distinguish us Baptists from certain other groups, we've tossed around this phrase, once saved, always saved, until it has come to imply something that is explicitly unscriptural. Many people today have deceived themselves into thinking they are going to heaven, but in reality, they are putting their faith in a phrase. Once saved, always saved. And if you were to ask them, why do you think you're saved? Why do you think you will go to heaven? They cannot tell you about their daily active faith in Jesus Christ. To them, they're just hanging on to a phrase they heard at church. Once saved, always saved. This is how this misunderstanding of the phrase goes. They think, once saved, always saved. I asked Jesus a long time ago to come into my heart. And so now I can live how I want. And God has to take me to heaven. They think, once saved, always saved. I prayed the sinner's prayer. At some point in the past, I spoke the magic formula. So now, it doesn't matter who I listen to or what God I worship, I can believe anything I want and I'll make it to heaven. What saved, always saved. I walked down an aisle at church or at youth camp. I got baptized in front of God and Grandma. So now, I can forsake my commitment to Christ, live as if He doesn't exist, and He is on the hook. Once saved, always saved. I prayed for Jesus to save me. I had tears streaming down my face. But now, I'm an atheist, or at best an agnostic. I don't even think I believe in God anymore. But just in case He exists, I've got my get-out-of-hell-free card. I believe in once saved, always saved, and I'm not even a believer. Listen to me. I've got news for you. There will be no unbelievers in God's kingdom. There will be no atheists in God's kingdom. There will be no worshipers of other gods in God's kingdom. If you're holding on to the phrase, once saved, always saved, to justify your lack of ongoing faith in Christ and yet somehow get into heaven, then you very well may have been deceived by an argument that sounds reasonable. Let me show you what a real follower of Jesus Christ looks like. It's found in verse 6 of the passage that we read. Just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in Him. How 
Did you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? You did it by believing. That's the only way, by believing in Him, right? Scripture directs you to keep on believing. Keep on believing. You see, the main deception bound up in what we Baptists have allowed the once saved, always saved mantra to become is that we have implied that your past faith stays in the past and does not continue every day of your life. The reality is what you see in verse 6. The reality is that real faith in the past continues into the present and into the future. But the phrase, once saved, always saved, completely misses that reality. If the only faith in Jesus Christ that you have is a memory of some past event or some past feeling, that is the reason you have doubts about your salvation. A person whose faith in Christ is not active today has no assurance of his or her salvation. The question that we should ask is not, do you remember a time in your past when you did this or prayed that or did some other action? The question should be, who? is your Lord and Savior right now. And if Jesus is your Lord, are you living like it? Now, I'm not talking about sinless perfection. Every last one of us is very far from that. I'm asking, is there any semblance in your life anywhere that Jesus is actually Lord? Are you bearing any fruit for Him whatsoever? If you were brought up on charges of being a follower of Christ, would there be any evidence whatsoever to convict you? Or is the only faith you're hanging on to some phrase you heard a Baptist pastor say from the pulpit, a phrase which never actually appears in the Bible? The way you live each day needs to be in harmony with the message that you received so long ago. And that decision that you made to follow Christ way back when, whenever it was, a minute ago, a year ago, decades ago, if it was real, it will eventually show up in the results of your life. As we read in verse 7. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in Him, being rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with gratitude. I put the words being rooted in all caps and in red because this is what happened to you when you got saved. This, according to the tense of this verb, this is an action that God did in a point in time in your past. He rooted you in Christ. It's like you're a plant, and he planted you in Christ, and there you remain. Your rooting in Christ, your planting in Christ, this was not something you did to yourself. It was something that God did to you when you decided to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you are planted in Christ, you don't need to be replanted. You are in Christ. You don't need to be saved over and over and over and over and over and over again. You get saved once. God has done this in your life. He has planted you in Christ. The question is this. Are you in Christ or not? You're one of the two. Every last one of us is. We are either planted in Christ or we have yet to be planted in Christ and we need to be. And so when you decide to have what I'm going to call believing loyalty for Christ. God plants you in Christ. And that phrase, believing loyalty, by the way, if we're going to make up phrases that people can hang on to, the phrase believing loyalty is much more scriptural than the phrase once saved, always saved. Because this 
indicates the kind of belief that we must have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your faith in Jesus today a believing loyalty? If you can say yes to that question, then I have no reason to ever wonder about your salvation. But if today in your heart of hearts you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not loyal to Christ at all, then you may have some business to do with the Lord. I hope that your faith in Christ is a believing loyalty and not just some one-off, meaningless decision that you checked off your bucket list. I've actually known people whose faith in Christ went this way. Mom or dad or grandma or grandpa said to the young person, you know what, you need to get baptized and become a member of the church. And the young person said, well, how do I do that? And they said, well, during the, invita- during the invitation to church on Sunday, well, just go up and tell the preacher you ask Jesus into your heart, and then he'll baptize you next week, and that's all there is to it. And the young person goes, okay. And so there's no conviction of sin. There's no repentance. There's no spiritual transformation. There's no salvation that has occurred. What has occurred is self-deception. And then, on top of that, we tell the person, hey, once saved, always saved. Don't worry about living for Christ. Don't worry. Don't concern yourself with actually following Him day after day, as He commands. Just go live your life however you wish, as if Jesus isn't Lord of anything, and, and because you got your ticket punched to heaven. We'll see you there someday. And so we wonder why we produce generation after generation of of so-called Christians who are self-deceived. And and I'm very concerned that they're, they're going to be in for quite a shock on the Day of Judgment. If you do not today have belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one risen from the dead, and that belief is a belief of loyalty and devotion to Him, This is what you need. And after God roots you in Christ, He does continually does four things in your life. And those are the four things that are underlined on the screen. He builds you up in Christ. He establishes you in the faith. He continues to teach you just as you were taught on the day of your salvation. And He continues to help your heart overflow with gratitude. And so today, if you were to tell me, yes, I have believing loyalty in the Lord Jesus Christ. My decision, whenever it was in the past, it was real. And I'm devoted to Christ. And I believe that He rose from the grave. And He is Lord over all. You tell me that. And then you ask the question, what am I supposed to do next? Here's what you're supposed to do next. Just don't resist God. Don't resist God. You're like, like what? How do, I, how do people resist God? Christians resist God by living in sin. By hanging on to some kind of sin that keeps them from going with God. And so instead they, they, they butt their head up against God. And so they resist Him. And if you were to ask me, well, what, what's an example of living in sin? If I, say the, if I say the phrase, don't live in sin, and something comes to mind, that's what I'm talking about. Okay? Resisting God is like trying to ride your bicycle headlong into a strong West Texas wind. You're going to get tired. You're going to get dirty. You're going to get worn out. It's no fun. However, if you were to turn around and go with the wind instead of against it, that's much easier. And that's what God wants you to do in life. Flow with His Spirit. Don't resist. You might say, well, wait a second, preacher. If I turn around and I go the other direction, I'm not going to end up at my destination, right? 
And I'm going to say, that's exactly right. You'll end up at the destination God wants you to be at. I mean, who says the destination that you keep striving for in life is the right one anyway? Especially if you're, you're living for yourself and not living for God. In the end, you have a decision that you need to make. Every last one of us does. If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have faith in Christ, you're devoted to Him, then your decision today is this. Am I going to resist God for the rest of my life or am I going to flow with Him? But if today you would say to yourself and say to God, I don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Either I don't believe that he rose from the grave, or I don't believe that he's Lord over, li- over, over my life or Lord over all. Or if you would say to me, I have zero desire whatsoever to do what Jesus says, then I would say, I would ask you to do this. I would ask you to get serious with God about your salvation. You need to do business with the Lord. My mom, as long as I've known her, has been a godly, wonderful woman. She grew up in church. In fact, her daddy was best friends with the pastor at the church, Sagamore Hill Baptist Church. Fred Swank was the pastor's name. And my grandparents, my mom's parents, lived across the street at 605 Hughes Avenue in Fort Worth, Texas. And they became good friends with Pastor Swank. And my mom grew up, went to youth camp. She did all the churchy things, very devoted, in church every single Sunday. She brought me to church every single Sunday, even when Dad had to work as an air traffic controller. Mom had me at church. One day I finally asked mom, tell me about when you got saved. And mom said, I thought I was saved for a long time. She said, but it was right around the time you were born, when I was 31 years old. And by the way, that's 52 years ago. My mom was 31 years old when she realized that any decision that she had made in the past really wasn't real. Not with her relationship with Christ. And that she needed to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And so she devoted herself to the Lord Jesus Christ. So she went forward. She told Brother Swank, who always called her little girl, even when my mom was older. And she said, I need to get saved. And he said, I'm glad you came to this decision. And she got baptized, rebaptized, really, because she was baptized before. But she got baptized after her salvation. That night, my dad couldn't sleep because my dad thought, If this lady, who's the godliest lady I know, isn't saved, what does that say about me? And my mom and my dad tell me they stayed up all night as my dad wrestled with his own salvation. And he came to the conclusion that he truly was devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know where you are with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is worth wrestling over. It is worth settling. I do know this. If you're not devoted to the Lord, you need to be.